events coming up. Uh, we will try to record these events and to put them online. This is also a first in that respect. We have learned from UNAM, which has been doing that for quite some time, particularly Uriigas. So thank you very much for inspiring us. No, thanks to you. <laughs> um, we are particularly happy to have such a wonderful speaker here today, uh, Dr. Pedro Salazar Ubarte from Uriigas. He heads Mexico's, I think, easily most important legal research institute at UNAM. For people who are not from Mexico, they're all, already the institution of UNAM is incomprehensible. If I'm correctly informed, you have roughly 300,000 students. Yes, it's true. Just the legal department, and I don't speak of the law faculty, just the legal department of lawyers, are 500 lawyers working for the university. So that is the institution in which uh, Pedro works. Um, the Legal Research Institute is unique in that it combines researchers and pays them for research, something that is not very common in the Latin American region. It's, in fact, it's rather uncommon anywhere in the world. Um, Pedro is actually both a lawyer and a political scientist by training, having studied in both Mexico and obtained a doctorate in Italy. He is a citizen of the world. He has <laughs> projects in more countries than I could name without wasting your time. <laughs> he advises very many major institutions in Mexico. And he will speak today about a topic that is close to his heart and in fact close to the heart of anyone interested in Mexico, the struggle for rights in Mexico and Latin America. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I also want to just quickly welcome Estefania de la Embajada Mexicana. Gracias, le agradezco mucho su presencia. Uh, we are very happy to have you here today. And thank you very much yes, you. for making this journey. And I hope there will be many more oh. journeys to come. Thanks to you, Colin. Well, in this occasion, I know that many people speak Spanish, but obviously they will speak in English. I will try to do so. And unfortunately, to do so in a proper way, I, I have to read. It's, it's going to be better, believe me. But anyway, I, I want to say something in Spanish first. And I want to say gracias. Gracias, Estefania, por, por venir. Gracias eh, a quienes están acá de México y de otros países de Latinoamérica. Para mí es un gusto poder eh, participar en un evento organizado en esta universidad, eh, por nuestra universidad y por King's College, y quería decir eso únicamente en español porque es un agradecimiento a quienes eh, nos acompañan desde Latinoamérica y una advertencia de que no hablo con la misma fluidez en español que en inglés y entonces la lectura pues de alguna manera entorpece la exposición. Pero, the other thing that I want to say is thank you, thank you to Holger, thank you to Luis, it's really, really for me a very important occasion it's the first activity that we organize together, let me uh, say so, because UNAM uh, has now this center here at, at King's College and will be, and I, that's the idea, uh, a point of, 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 I don't know, of linking with different, different universities here in the UK. And for us, as UNAM, it's really a great opportunity to, to do so. It's not going to be only for law and for political science, it's going to be for all different matters, but well, in this occasion, it's going to be this, this the topic. I, I will talk about rights, it's true, I will talk about rights and constitutional rights in Latin America, but I will, I will talk too about democracy. I think that there is a strong linkage between rights and democracy, and obviously and sadly, I will talk about these topics uh, from a, a worry point of view, from, 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 the, from the problems that we are facing. And, and, and then I will not do just, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 an exposition of the good things that we are doing in Latin America. I will try to, to advertise the problems and the risks that we are facing now. Let me. Uh, say first, uh, just the first test is that I know that it's a common place and, and in some sense is simple. Uh, in fact, it's not an original thesis, but I think that it's important to say so. Democracy needs rights to establish itself as a form of, as, as a form of government supported by political autonomy of the people. 
From the opposite perspective, this form of government is an institutional guarantee for the rights agenda to remain current. On the one hand, it is about the old idea regarding the preconditions of democracy. The guarantee of some social, not just liberal rights, is a condition of the freedom that, in turn, provides support to political rights. On the other hand, but simultaneously, it is about the argument that the political participation of citizens is a mechanism that inhibits the concentration of powers and prevent abuses in the exercise of power, which makes it a tool, it a tool sorry, that offers a guarantee of these rights. In the end, the circular closes. Rights are a condition of democracy, and democracy, in turn, provides them protection. This will be so important for me because I will talk about the problems that our democracies are facing in Latin America because the rights and, and, and mainly the social rights are not guaranteed in fact. I think, and I will say so, that the social problem is maybe the most important uh, uh, problem that we are um, uh, carrying on and that are uh, complicate and, and making now very complicate, complicate for our countries to consolidate democracy. And also I will talk about something, just something about uh, violence and the criminal problems that we are facing. And at the end, if you want, uh, I will offer you a reflection about what's happening, for example, in cases as Ayotzinapa. But I will not put Ayotzinapa in the core of the presentation. I will left it to uh, the, the last part and just to make a, a, a reflection about that. My point is that uh, in the last decade, and you know so, and now I will talk about not just constitutional rights, but about political transformation in Latin America, the political science research focuses which of, uh, much of its attention on the so-called transitions towards democracy. The thesis proposes, as you know, by Samuel Huntington, of various ways of democratization was well received and was reproduced by various scholars, particularly in Latin America, but not only in Latin America. Uh, from a descriptive point of view, the thesis uh, was accurate. In a few decades, there were significant changes in the political institutions and the political practices of many countries of different countries. First, at the end, as you know well, of the Second World War, some Western European countries were democratized. democratized sorry. Later, the time came to abandon the dictatorial regimes in Spain and Portugal. Those were the first two waves that would allow Norberto Bobbio to write his famous essay of the sorry, this, future of democracy and the time of rights. His theoretical definitions and observations provided a solid conceptual source for those who were studying what was taking place. To put it briefly, it was a common phenomenon that involved abandoning the institutions and practices that were characterized of different types of autocracies in favor of rules or electoral processes based on universal suffrage, free vote, systems of multiple and competitive parties, elections determined by majority rule, and conditions for the possibility of political success of minorities. In most countries, reconstitutionalization processes accompany the process of political change. I refer that, uh, to the approval of constitutional reforms or directly of new constitutions based, based on the principle of the division of powers and which recognize a broad range of human or fundamental rights of individuals. The set of, of constitutional rights includes liberties, political rights, and to a greater or lesser measure, social rights in a guaranteeing conditions of material or sustainable equality. Thus, in Western Europe, the continent, countries developed a model of political organization that the scholars such as Luigi Ferraioli or Michelangelo Borbero would call constitutional democracies. As you know, there are some specific institutions that characterize this form of organization of powers. It's not the same organization that you have here in the UK because you don't have a writing constitution, but in these uh, democracies, 
uh, uh, one of the main institutions is a written constitution with political and a, a group of political uh, and social and liberal rights recognized. But not just that, another kind of institution like se separation of powers and one that is really, really important in these countries as the uh, constitutional courts are, are, are one of the most important, more, most important institutions. Um, uh, this constitutional rights has the important and specific function of control over the constitutionality of the laws. And that's why it's so important in these countries, at least in Latin American countries, to have a guarantee the independence of these constitutional laws, constitutional courts, sorry. Um, I will not, I will just say that about the institutions because I think that, I think that it's most important to say something about the political process and the political problems and social problems that we are facing. The point is that in the 90s of the last century, the wave of democratization arrived in Latin American countries, at, it ruled in Eastern Europe. Thus, the democratic constitutional model that I have described in these seconds was incorporated in, into the constitutions in Colombia in 1891. Peru in 1893, Argentina in 1894, Ecuador in 1899, and in Mexico, with various reforms to our constitutional text of 1917, uh, and also with many, many co uh, constitutional adjustments and jurisprudential frameworks was, was arrived. And the same happens in other moments and with another political process in Uruguay, Brazil, and Chile in the same years. That is why, as indicated earlier, during those years and up to the first decade of this century, academic studies and Latin American public debate were orientated to study, explain, and compare the transitions to democracy in their regional nations. Discussions focuses on clarifying which system had taken the final step toward democratization, the nature of the party systems that were being developed, what were the best rules for the integration of the bodies of political representation? What distinguished the electoral system of the different countries? Whether it was advisable to introduce futures such as the second round and voting and so on. Then it was a discussion about the institutions of formal or electoral democracy. And that was really, really the most important discussions in the academics in that years. If we, if we think of the institutional designs and we compare constitutional texts that were approved in those years in most Latin American countries, we can say that what came as core on the continent was the European or continental style model of constitutional democracy. However, and that is going to be very important in my presentation, influenced by the institutional design of the United States, Latin American nations maintained the presidential ar arrangement that had been developed since the 19th century. This future of Latin American democracies did not go unnoticed among scholars. In academia, in fact, it caused inconclusive discussions that captured the, the attention of some of the most prominent social scientists of the time, Liz, Valenzuela, O'Donnell, and caught the attention of political theorists such as Sartori or Bovero. The core question that they all posed had to do with the incompatibility or compatibility of pres presidentialism with constitutional democracy. For critics of presidentialism, the decision to maintain the presidential system has been harmful for the consolidation of democracies. In the fact, for authors such Roberto Gargarella, that decision has been the main institutional burden that Latin American state must bear. This fact is important because, combined with a lack of social progress, it sets the basis for explaining some of the most adverse problems that have locked the establishment of democracy in Latin America. These problems have to do with, on one hand, the social conditions that, that frame the transition processes, 
and which I will discuss below, and on the other hand, with the actual institutional designs in which the presidential figure concentrates powers in detriment of, uh, to the legislatures and the judiciary. At the end of the third wave, the uh, ONDP, uh, the United National Development Program, raised an important question. Will it be possible to consolidate the new Latin American democracies in the context of poverty and inequality that characterize and continues to characterize the region? If we take the social agenda seriously, which underlines the goal of democratic constitutionalism, and we assume that this model of political organization can only be consolidated within certain political and social conditions, we have to accept that the reality in Latin America generally does not provide an environment that is conducive to the success of the transitions to the, of the third wave. Democratic constitutionalism in Latin America has had to deal with social contexts in which economic inequality, discrimination of many kinds, race, economic status, ethnicity, gender, health condition, etc., and political and social exclusions are a whispered reality. These situations waited for the transitions and, except for some minor exception, has remained unchanged. It is true that some social programs have been successful in certain countries, I am mean, thinking in Chile, Uruguay, and in some sense in Brazil. But it is also true that, in general, Latin America continues to be a continent of social fragmentation. That's why a vicious circle has been undermining the new democracies. They emerged in adverse conditions that have not yet been overcome, and the anger caused by this has been directed not only toward the leaders in office, but also at the institutional agreements. This is explained largely because the democratic transitions were accompanied by expectations, by expectations not only of political change, but also of social emancipation. And the latter remains an unfinful promise. Therefore, if we go along with that, uh, of, uh, sorry, if we go along with what the opinion polls show, Latin American disapprove of the governments of the democratic period and at the same time they spawn the institutions that make the democratic gain possible. Unfortunately, a recent history, history shows this is the, dom the dominant trend in various countries in the region after two decades of democratic experience. To understand the setting, it is important to mention some of the official data. In Latin America, there are about 130 million people who live in conditions of chronic poverty. But poverty is not the only problem. There is another key matter that has been growing, inequality. This is probably the social burden that is felt the most and the one that is most difficult to overcome in Latin America. So, the democracies of the third wave have faced a social pressure, poverty and inequality, unknown to European democracies. And yet, it's true, in recent years, especially after the economic crisis of 2008, the, democr the democracies of the first waves are also facing difficult times. The lesson, I think, is telling. The economic and social dimension is of enormous importance for political systems. Latin American governments, or in a broad sense, the dominant political classes, must produce results in this area in, or in order to survive. To top it off, in recent years, throughout Latin America, especially in countries like Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, and in Central America too, in general, 
an additional disruptive force has gained strength. You know that, and it's a shame, but it's true, social and criminal violence. Again, the data is alarming. According to the World Health Organization, in 2012, there were 165,000 deaths from homicides in the region. I will explain some of these numbers. It means that, for example, 28.5 uh, sorry, homicides uh, per 100,000 inhabitants, which is more than four times the global rate. The most violent country is Honduras at all. There were 103 period nine people per 100,000 murdered each year. In Venezuela, the homicide rate is 57 period six. Jamaica, Belize, and El Salvador follow with homicide rates of 45 period one, 44 period seven, and 43 period nine, respectively, obviously, per 100,000 inhabitants. Mexico has a rate of 24 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. The comparison with your countries, with the countries from here, with the countries of the first and second democracy waves, is revealing. Germany and Spain have homicide rates of period eight per, per number. Italy, period nine. And Portugal is in problems. They have one period two, to cite only four examples. <laughs> the comparison, I think, that is really, really impressive. Uh, if, we look, if we look at the development of Latin American democracies in the years that have grown by since the democratization wave, we see, as we have just <coughs> noted, that unfortunately both the institutions, the science and the pending social needs have been undermining democracies, in democratic institutions in two ways. That's going to be my theoretical thesis of today. I will argue that in spite of the institutional designs oriented towards democratic constitutionalism, in fact, Latin American electoral democracies, because they are electoral democracies, have become deformed by two models of apparent democracies. I'm taking the idea from Michelangelo Bovero. I, no, I will not stole that from Michelangelo apparent democracies is an idea that he has. Well, some of them are oligarchic pseudo-democracies, and others are populist pseudo-democracies. In both contexts of pseudo-democracies, there are ruling elites that administer power in an oligarchic style or in a populist style. The first group manages the power they have obtained at the polls with a clientelistic logic that enables them to hold on to it without distributing it. The second group uses permanent social mobilization to create an appearance of inclusion, which in fact is only symbolic and rhetorical. In the end, in both cases, power remains concentrated in a few hands and democratic citizenship is con conspicuous by its absence. The interesting thing is that the elites governing Latin American countries are elected by the institutions created during the transitions, therefore, to the extent they formally have a democratic legitimacy. But they are apparent democracies, I told you. Some are characterized in this way because elections serve to legitimize an oligarchic group that centralizes the political and economic power of the country and which, throughout the electoral game, take turns holding government positions. I'm thinking, for example, in Mexico. Although there are different political parties, in reality, they all are behind the same economical model, which is known in, La in Latin America as neoliberalism. Uh, they promote the same interest and they defend similar policies. Thus, there is not real alternation when the party in power changes, at least not in the economical model. While 
There are alternative political parties. The leaders of these parties give tacit approval of the key issues that remain unchanged, no matter who wins. This explains why the characteristic features of society, poverty, inequality, and violence, are maintained over time. It has to do with the oligarchic pseudo-democracies. The populist pseudo-democracies are located at the other end of the equation. These phenomena are apparent in countries such as Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, and, to some extent, Argentina, and are increasingly uh, evident in Nicaragua and El Salvador. It is interesting to note that this phenomena emerged after political crisis that undermined the oligarchic pseudo-democracies that existed in each of these countries. In fact, in the last decade of the 20th century, the nations that I have in mind moved toward constitutional democracy, like the rest of the states in the region, and adopted the institutions we are familiar with. But after a few years, the political institutions faced serious crises of legitimacy. Populist regimes with a democratic appearance emerged from those crises. In some of the countries that went through this process, some even, uh, <coughs> some even adopted new constitutions like Venezuela in 1999, Ecuador 2008, and Bolivia uh, 2009. There was activated what some have called, in fact, the new Latin American constitutionalism. I don't know if you have heard something about that, this the Nuevo Constitucionalismo Latinoamericano that it's uh, the, 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 the model of constitutionalism that they adopted. It is a form of constitutionalism that openly distances itself from the democratic constitutional model, which, as we know, is of the European continental origin, and is proposed as an alternative Latin American model. Thus, in this context, constitutional democracy has been openly abando abandoned. And one of the aspects emphasized in these constitutional documents is the alleged social inclination of the movements that inspired them, their inclusive and anti-neoliberal character. So, even, even though the countries are sign significantly different, we can group them by highlighting common features of their political and constitutional systems. The dismantling of the system of political parties, a strong leadership, relations of presidents, permanent political mobilization, inclusive social discourse, rhetoric about human rights, and a nationalist economic project. Keeping in mind that each case responded to particular conditions, we can say that in general, what happened in these countries was that democratic institutions, especially the party system, and the ruling elites organized, them, organized them themselves in an, an oligarchic style, concentrated the political, economical, and media powers and were unable to provide answers to the social demands of its poor and unequal populations. So, their way displaced by populist movements, led by non-charismatic leaders, Chavez, Correa, Morales, and Kirchner, those who Michelangelo Bovero would call postmodern caudillos, or leaders. I'm, I'm finishing. An interesting aspect to highlight is the rightful place for presidentialism in these models and process. In the case of the oligarchy pseudo-democracies, presidents play a role of enormous symbolic importance, and they serve as the great articulators of fundamental political decisions. For example, this is the case when they undertake epic actions such as the fight or war against organized crime, like in Mexico or in Colombia. Although presidential elections is provide, is, uh, for, uh, provided in some countries, in Mexico, for example, uh, there are no exceptions, and in Colombia is limited to two consecutive terms, 
In every country, the president remains a central figure in the operation of the respective political system. In fact, the change in presidential leadership does not diminish the importance of the charge of the president president. The interesting thing is that such an exacerbated presidentialism, in some cases, was the cause of the crisis that opened the door from oligarchy towards populism. The uh, failure of the De La Rua in Argentina, I think that is an emblematic case. But populism has also made presidentialism its way of life. In fact, this form of political organization depends on the existence of a leader who acts as the direct representative of the people's will. Therefore, in populism systems, the medi mediational institutions like political parties and parliaments tend to disappear and the power is concentrated in one single person. Maduro is an excellent example. Thus, also in these cases, but with a more personalized imprint, the president is the central political player in this form of distorted democracy. In fact, in the countries where populism, pseudo-democracy, has maturated, it has taken the form of re-election. In some cases, like Venezuela, and now in Ecuador, and in Bolivia, indefinite. In the future of democracy, Bobbio recalls that at the end of World War II, Max Weber, in his famous lecture on science as a vocation to students at the University of Munich said to the audience, which repeatedly asked in opi his opinion about Germany's future, the prophet and the demagogue do not belong on the academic platform. Following that advice, I will be cautious in my concluding remarks. I envision two possible safeguards of Latin American democracies. One of them, involves economic growth and the distribution of wealth and equality, inclusion, and non-discrimination. I know that this is a commonplace and somewhat obvious, but not because of that it's any less true. Democracy, as I have already insisted, requires certain social conditions in order to exist. Such conditions may be persistent to the transitions processes towards democratizations, or they can be generated on the political once the political system becomes democratic. In the first case, consolidations will depend on whether those conditions are maintained. In the second, on its eventual materialization. But what is true, and what is important, is that it is about conditions that are logically necessary in order for democracies to last over time. Actually, it is a question of taking rights seriously, as Joaquin said, by providing effective institutional guarantees. These are, in particular, social rights, <coughs> housing, health, food, work, education, that are aimed at transforming the living conditions of the people. From this pers perspective, strictly speaking, democratic constitutions provide for a virtuous agenda that must be advanced, advanced simultaneously. Fundamental rights are functional for the effectiveness of democratic institutions, and these give legitimacy to governments that must provide guarantee to the former. In this circle, if this circle were activated, democracy would be shielded socially, and with that, the oligarchic pact will be broken, and or the populist tendencies will be disactivated. The other being offering an opportunity to salvaguard the Latin American democratic system is the regional human rights system, for me at least. The organization of American state with its Inter-American Commission and Court has been 
a security valve for democracy, for democracies in the region. Questioned by the oligarchic pseudo-democratic when they widen the guarantee of social rights, and lambasted by the populist pseudo-democracies when they warn against the, and condemn their excesses, these regional institutions continue to be a hope for the regional constitutional democratic model. That is why some thinkers have been promoting the idea of the Latin American Jus Comune of Human Rights. It's an, ide an ideal project aimed at building shared normative elements that will allow expose of abuses and guidance of public policies in the different states. It is potential to consolidate democratic constitutionalism lies in the fact that it seeks to promote the idea that countries put into place the constitutional machinery that they adopted when they transitioned towards democracy. With this, among other consequence, consequences, the power of the preceding president will be delim delimited and the doors will be closed to the implementation of security policies of an authoritarian nature. It's true that there is not much room for optimism, but safeguards face crude underdevelopment and harsh resistance. But as Bob you knew, dissatisfaction with reality could be a good start. Knowing where we stand is a beginning, and today we know that the ground of our democracies is unstable. It is moving from oligarchic toward populism. Hence we, can, we, hence, we can be aware of this, and as Maria Zambrano said, historical consciousness is historical responsibility. Our, our responsibility is to understand what is happening in our countries and try to do something to consolidate that democracy that were so difficult to us to build in the last years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have a little bit of time for questions, then there will be a reception. Okay. Um, hello, uh, my name is Alejandro de Cos, I'm a student here well at the Elements School of Economics. Uh, um, as I'm sure you are aware, the constitutional processes in both Ecuador and Bolivia had a strong participation from different indigenous communities <coughs> that were pushing for a legal pluralism. And I was wondering, in this future model you are uh, thinking, is there a place for these kinds of demands from uh, indigenous peoples calling for a uh, dual system where they have their own um, ways of putting forward laws that enable a different kind of democracy? I don't know if I enable a different kind of democracy, but I think that it's so important to guarantee a place to these communities in our democracies. And in that sense, I think that it was a good idea, and maybe it's the most important parts of these constitutions, the way in which the communities participated in the pro constitutional process and uh, the articles in which their rights are recognized. I think that it is one of the most important things and the most beautiful faces of these constitutions. That's why, for example, Roberto Gargarella said, and I agree with him, that uh, the, the face of the equality agenda of these constitutions is the most uh, important uh, and, and strong part of them. The problem for me is in the other part of the constitutions, not in the rights uh, recognized. The part that I am worried about that is the organizing of powers. For example, I am sure, and I can, I can prove that, that the most presidentialist constitution in all Latin American countries is Ecuador. But in the constitution, you will find rules that really make the president a very, very powerful figure. And I think that that presidentialism is not a good idea for consolidate constitutional democracies. 
because we have this autocratic figure in the core of our political system. And as we know in Venezuela, in Bolivia, and, and I can say in other countries, at, at the end of the day, uh, these political processes not only uh, went back to go back to, to an authoritarian regime, but it's the <coughs> worst way to try to guarantee the rights. That's why I'm, I'm saying that, for example, for me, system, uh, Latin American, uh, Sistema Latin American, uh, Interamericano de Derechos Humanos is so important because uh, if you read the sentences of the court, you will find that they are trying to work in both directions. They are trying to work against presidentialism in the political agenda and they are trying to work for all the rights, including the communities' indigenous rights. And I think that's, that's the, 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 the scope that we try and should try to, to, to realize. Uh, I'm Sandra Carrizosa. Um, I am a student of the London School of Economics. And I would like to ask you how to understand these uh, phenomena, uh, different phenomena of violence, uh, specifically in Mexico, and how to understand them within the context of uh, trying to push our uh, like efforts of the Mexican states in consolidate uh, human rights. Violence, that's <laughs> a huge question. Thank you, Sandra, because we met. <laughs> I appreciate your question. Okay, I am really will be cautious in my, in my answer because it's a very, very difficult uh, topic and I do not consider myself, myself an expert in that specific thing. I will say so. I think that we're facing different kinds of violence. We have in our countries, not just in Mexico, social violence that is related with the incapability of our governments and of our states to guarantee the rule of law, the real rule of law. No? And then when the state doesn't work in that sense, the social violence tends to grow. Now, that's one aspect, and we have that aspect. And, and, and we were doing well in that sense in the last years. The problem is that since, I don't know, 2006, the things has changed, at least in Mexico. We have another kind of violence that it's the most difficult to face now, that is what we name the criminal organized organi criminal violence. It's not just drugs, but it's drugs. Is arms too, and, and we weapons, and we and we are having very very big problems with that. And as you know, it's a trafficking. No, it's the third. That organizations of crime are really violent in itself, and we know that they are really strong. They have a lot of weapons, and they are doing. They are trying to control parts of our countries, and in that sense. They are obviously putting in <coughs> the population in a very difficult condition from, from that. But we're facing an another kind of problem that it's the government violence, the state violence. Because the way in which in some countries, as in Mexico, the state decided to face these criminal organizations, I think that it is the worst way to do so, that it's with the military. And now, as we know, we are having, for example, in, in Mexico, again, a serious crisis in human rights, in basic human rights. And that is really sad. That's a big problem because it contributes to deslegitimize the state. And I think that it's an, an, an Ayotzinapa has to do with all of these problems. Ayotzinapa is a sad situation, a, a really probably the, one of the worst events that had happened in Mexico in the recent years. But if we watch a, 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 a Josinapa problem, we will find that all these factors are combined there. We have a social problem that uh, has a political manifestation. We have crime organization that works there. And we know that, at the moment we know, that at least 
local policies were involved in the violent events. Then the state, the organized crime, crime and the social crime were together the factors that explain what happened that day in Iguala. No? And I think that the, the most, I, I told that to Luis yesterday, I think that the most sad thing, thinking in a Jotzinapa is that a Jotzinapa is just one of many similar events that are happening and happening in Mexico in these years. And that's, uh, I think, that one of the, of the, the most uh, preocupantes cosas that we have in the past. <laughs> oh, so many questions. Let's start in the back. Okay, thank you. I'm Pedro Pablo. I'm studying Latin American development here at King's. And it's, it's very great that you talk about discrimination because not many people talk about that. But I was wondering, what do you think that are the best strategies to fight and prevent discrimination? And what's your opinion on uh, starting uh, strategies like uh, laws that fight discrimination or special commissions that come from the government to prevent that? Do you think that they work or what else could be done about the problem? Maybe we can call it just one, two, or three. Yes, it's kind of related. I'm, I'm wondering uh, whether a truth commission is happen in Mexico. Or what Excuse might. me? Sorry, truth it's commission. A truth, truth commission, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And let's take another one and then. How are you from UCL? Um, I'm just wondering uh, why do you think there's such a big gap of, uh, between theory that seems very sensible and the practice, you know, what you see and hear? Uh, governments do in Mexico and politicians do in Mexico. So why do we have that? We'll have a second round. So. Okay, <laughs> I will be. Um, okay. I think that the first the first thing that we have to do with discrimination is recognize how deep is in our countries. That's the first step. Because as I said, we have many different kinds of discriminations in our countries. And, 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 and I think that sometimes, <coughs> at least in Mexico, we try to say that it's not so, so, so problematic as it, it is. No? The second is that I think that it's important to uh, distinguish the different kinds of discriminations and the different groups that are involved and that suffer discrimination. Because maybe we should try to make a specific political po public policies for the different kinds of discrimination. And I think that, for example, it's not the same gender than the problems that we have with uh, communities of in indigenous in, in, in our countries. And it's not the same problem with these communities in Bolivia than in Mexico, for example. No? Th then we have to distinguish That's the, the other thing. And I think that these uh, uh, commissions, like, for example, we have in Mexico this CONAPRED, Consejo Nacional para Prevenir la Discriminación, I think that it's a good idea. It's a, it's a good idea because, at least in Mexico, in the last years, they are doing well their task. We, we have good results in some aspects of discrimination. But I don't know if the best way to do so is having a specific uh, commission in charge of fight discrimination. Maybe the m best way to face this problem is having a really a structural public policy, transversal public, public policy to fight against this problem. And that's what we don't have, at least not in Mexico. And I don't know, uh, in Argentina there is another commission, it's named INADI, that has the same responsibility. But I think that are institutions that try to fight against a very, very big problem, and that's why sometimes they are not able to defeat that. No? I think that. Uh, try <coughs> true Commission, Commission de la Verdad. Ooh, difficult topic, because, no, no, important one. Uh, now we, we are talking that now we are taking another uh, Congress seminar, I don't know, in, in, in Minnesota, that they are talking about this problem about Mexico. The point is that, and I, I, I 
Voy despacio. This idea of true commissions were thinking and are working on countries that have to that have to face violence, violence, political violence that happened before the transitions. Okay? And that's the way in which new democracies try to process from an institutional point of view with the horror of the past. Okay? That's difficult. We know that different countries have to deal with that in different ways because it's not the same with Uruguay than Argentina than Brazil that are, they are having a problem with that now. And it was not the same problem that they had to deal with in Peru, for example. No? The problem that we have now in Mexico, and in some sense, sense in Colombia, is that the violence, violence that we have to deal with is violence that is happening after democratic transitions. It's a different kind of problem, because it's true that the state is one of the actors involved, but it is not the same authoritarian state that that, that committed that kind of crimes in the other countries. Then the idea of a commission of a true commission is should <coughs> has to change if we want to use it to explain and to uh, uh, res make a research of what happened in, in countries as Mexico. No, it's a different kind. Of Something is happening now, something is just for a specific problem and it's really, really concrete, the situation, but with the experiment that is happening with Ayotzinapa and this group of experts of the, Latin, the Inter American Commission uh, that they are trying to explain what happened there. I know that it's not the same idea of a truth commission that make a, a, a very big I don't know process of what happened, but some of that is happening now, and I just want to say that I, I wonder about that. I don't know how to deal with this kind of violence in democratic times, because theory told us that in democratic period, violence should be dismissed, and that is not happening with us. No? I have a geopolitical explanation, but it's too long to go there. But well, that's that's the problem, and and has to do with this idea of the how to explain this big gap between theory and reality. Well, I I just will say for this complex question two concrete things. The first is in the political arena, the reality has changed with the democratization. That is true. The way in which now politicians have to uh, move in the political arena is different because the elections are true. We can see what's happening now in Argentina and what happened in Mexico a few months ago. And the elections are true. The, the political parties works. That, that is true. The point is that the main decisions, for example, in the economic agenda, has not changed. And this is the second point that I want to say. I think that the reality is not the same, but it's very similar to the past. Because we are not facing the structural problem of the poverty and the inequality. That's the problem for our countries. Mm -hmm. Because Mexico is not a poor country. It's not, in, <laughs> you, you can go there and say, okay, this is not, a, and we know that for that, I don't know, we, we are the number eight economy of the world or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, 13, Five, but it's a big one. Uh, Mexico. The problem is that we have really a social structure that it's uh, the, 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 the world is concentrated in a few hands. And, and now, if you want to read something about that, I really, really recommend you a paper that, that was written by Gerardo Esquivel for Oxfam. That it's really excellent because they they, because it's not only him, it's another author, they explain not just how deep is the problem of the inequality in Mexico, but they explain why. And one of the theses that is Marx, it's not just it's Marx, but the thesis is simple. 
They say because now this new democratic system in Mexico, that's why I say an oligarchic one, it's captured that money, that the private groups that have the money. And that, it's a good explanation. And that's why we don't have reforms that really, really, really change the uh, relation, the link between political power and economic one, and media one. And if that happens, Marx have good <laughs> So we have one more round of questions. And I remember you had a question. Yeah, you had a question and you had a question. So. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very stimulating. Um, I have been, I'm not here only to mention the embassy and I was invited to be here, but because this specific topic is of my personal interest. Actually, my thesis when I graduated with Alejandro Anaya, who you know very well, was exactly about whether democracy is a prerequisite for human rights or human rights are a prerequisite for democracy. So it's very close to my heart. Um, I have two questions. The first one has to do with the <coughs> discussion in Mexico, which is also a, is not a new discussion. It's been there at least for 15 years about the reform of state. And how is that linked to the constitutional reform of human rights? Because obviously I'm, I'm talking about the 2011. And not only the human rights reform, but together with the Amparo reform and the reform on the criminal justice of the 2008. And how, especially the human <coughs> rights reform, only uh, touch upon, I'll say in Spanish, la parte dogmática, mm -hmm. and not la parte orgánica. So um, I think that the discussion around what is the model and how the electoral democracy model is not quite um, effective for some countries, including Mexico, perhaps has something to do with how the concentration of power is and what has been done from both the academic side to the government side to the legislative power and the judicial power, which lately has produced lots of jurisprudence in the Supreme Court in particular um, on human rights. I just think it's stimulating what you said in terms of how it can change. And the other thing is about human rights in practice and in, the mo in like domestic and foreign policy and how they change. And specifically in the case of Mexico, because you mentioned how the inter-American system can be, again, a solution for changing our countries, and in particular, to make more effective human rights and democracy. So my question is specifically, like, what can be done? Because in my opinion, Mexico has done very much in that sense to protect the inter-American system of human rights. And when it was the discussion, I think it was like, 2011 around various attacks to the human rights system, the only country that really came about in the concert of inter-American countries was precisely Mexico. The other two, which are not part of the system, but are far in financing all of the efforts, are, are in a very, um, I would say, comfortable situation to promote that. But Mexico is part of the system, is perhaps uh, one of the many challenges that Mexico faces is to implement the judgments of the, the rulings, I believe, of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And I just think that it's fascinating how those tendencies of diplomacy and domestic foreign policies can promote change. Thank you. Yeah, I got two questions as well. Uh, <laughs> my system just <laughs> broke down. <laughs> okay, so we'll have you two, then we'll have the answer, and then we'll have the last. Okay, two people ask, and I sadly have to close the list. I will refrain from asking questions and would ask you all to then also withhold your questions and mm -hmm. ask them with wine next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, first, I just said uh, the social rights of us are. Uh, for, uh, logical precondition of democracy, I agree with that. But in Mexico, we don't have guaranteed that, and almost in Latin America, as you said. So maybe we can think that it's the other way around. That now the the, the end of democracy is to to, to fulfill these uh, social rights. Is is not uh, democracy uh, an end in itself? 
like maybe could be here in UK, Europe, and almost in all first world country. I think that they're in their political imaginary see democracy as an end in itself, but in Latin America and Mexico, we cannot see democracy like that. Democracy is a, 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 an instrument for uh, the distribution of, of wealth. At least I think we can, we can put that uh, as a thesis to discuss, uh, especially between this uh, the, the, the former question about the, the gap between theory and, and reality. Maybe our theory is, is wrong. The, the problem is with our theories, not with, with, not with the reality. Uh, and second, I think you have a great faith in courts, especially with the inter-American court. And I agree with that with the, because inter-American court, uh, it's a very progressive one. Uh, uh, almost no doubt, no, there is no doubt about that. But uh, the National Supreme Court of Mexico, may, it's in kind of ambiguity in, in, in that sense. We cannot say that me the Mexican court is a progressive one, at least not <coughs> to a full extent. So the problem with court is like we tend to elitize, so to speak, the, the democracy. And democracy is not about elites or something like that. No, it's not about expertise telling, uh, telling us what is the right thing to do and how to protect our, our rights and how to Im Im impl Im improve uh, the social development. Uh, I, I would so have to ask you to be brief, mostly because I see the piece of paper and there's no, <laughs> no space. <laughs> no, <laughs> notes for me. <laughs> so, and, and, the last minister, we have the perfect example. Medina Mora is a, uh, it's an example of how courts can be co-opted and not fulfill the demands of democracy, so to speak. OK. It's too much, but I will not speak about everything. Well, I will say, OK. Roberto Garagala, now I'm talking a many times about Roberto because we were together in Colombia a few weeks ago and we were discussing this, these things. And he has a thesis that I think that it's a good one for those, as me, uh, that are interested, really interested in human rights agenda. And he's saying that we, as you, as you say, that maybe we're, we forgot the important dimension of the institutional design. El cuarto de máquinas de la Constitución, he said, no? the organic dimension. And if we try to guarantee rights without a proper constitutional, institutional design, it's not going to be easy to do so. That, that's, I think that is one of the, 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 the questions that we have to make to ourselves now that we are changing, because we are changing a lot our states. Because I think, and sorry for the parochial the idea that at least in Mexico we are reforming our state since many years ago. Our state is not the same. It's a lie that we have not done a state reform. We did it. The, the, the good question is that if that design that we have now is orientated to the rights agenda or not, and I think that it's a question that we have to face from academic, but obviously from in public debate. And I will, I will say something about that, and I will link it with the idea of, of, of the social rights. For example, let, 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 let me tell you something. You, you were talking about some constitutional reforms, obviously this important reform of human rights, I decided not to talk about that because I thought that it was so local and it was going to be boring for you. But well, we, no, 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 to explain that reform, but we had this important reform. And then we changed the state in the last years to have these structural reforms to make the, the country moves that the idea of the president. No? Okay. I want to think if there is a match between these two agendas. And I will not do it now because I, I have to think about it, but I will put on an example of another reforms that maybe show us how we are taking 
con, con decisiones contradictorias, con, ¿sí? contradictory decisions, por ejemplo. En 2008, as you said, we have this important uh, um, reform from uh, the justice in Mexico. No? It was really an important reform and we said now we will have really, I, I will say it with these concepts, liberal reform orientated to the agenda of um, presumption de inocencia and guarantee the Bill of Rights and due process of law and so go on. And it was true that that part of the reform was orientated in that uh, constitutional uh, sense. Now that we are having this anniversary of the Carta Magna here, well, in that sense, no, that it's not passed from the from the ideological point of view. Well. Okay. But in the same day, the same day, we approve another reform in Justice Matter too. That was and is still today in the Constitution, inspired to the other side, la lógica del derecho penal del enemigo. That is the agenda of, I, I, I'm sorry because I don't know these terms in English, arraigo, the agenda of a uh, uh, régimen de delincuencias, uh, no? Especializada. So, a group of institutions that are really, really, really contradictory with the first agenda. I used to say that we have in Mexico una constitución esquizofrénica <coughs> in this matter because we have all notice and I think that that's a good, a good proof that maybe, maybe, maybe we are using the human rights agenda just as a rhetoric and symbolic experiment and, and I'm worried about it. You tell something about the inter-American system that for me is important and, and what you are saying is true. In Mexico we have in the last years Really, really, really a strong. Uh, we, we, we were uh, compromised with that agenda. My only, my only uh, problem now is that I am not sure that this will continue in the same direction. Because now we are dealing with decisions of the system that are putting our actual government in problems because the judges and the commissionados are telling us that we have human rights problems now in Mexico in this present moment. And I think that maybe that will change our compromise with that agenda. At least as an academic, I am worried for that. And I think that it's logical because it's so easy to say, okay, it was wrong when the court is telling you that something happened 20 years ago, but no two months ago or six months ago, because that are situations that you have to deal with and are your responsibility to say something about. And I think that that's the problem that we are having now, for example, with Ayotzinapa, and the problem that we had with the strong conflict between El Relator de Tortura and the government of Mexico a few months ago. Because this relator of Tortula told that in Mexico now we are having a very, very big problem with Tortula. And that's why the government said, no, it's that, no that is not true. No? And, and that's why I'm a little bit worried about that. But just to say that maybe, maybe for the social rights problem, just to say that, is that sometimes I am not an economist. But we, we should think that maybe we are just watching the institutional design from the political point of view, uh, from the uh, law point of view, constitutional point of view, but we have to say something about our economic model. <coughs> because I think that the problem is not with the democratic institutions. The democratic institutions are doing well, but they are, <laughs> that they can do, that it's organized in some peaceful way the, uh, the political competition to get the power. Okay, that's why democracy is a good idea, but the democracy is a good idea just for that. The problem is that for the rest of the pens, we are not 
taking the right decisions. And the right decisions has, I think, to watch the social problem. And the social problem only will be solved with and another economic decisions. And I think that that's the problem for me. No? And now, yes, the people is so angry with democracy. But the problem is not democracy. The problem is that democracy is just a, an instrumentum, a media to, to, to organize powers. And, 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 and the problem is another problem. But in that country, as I try to say, in which this anger against democracy grew, populism came. And, and it's just to, for those who are not in Mexico or in touch with Mexico in these days, it's really interesting that the president, Peña Nieto, is all the time saying, oh, we have to be aware of the populism. Populism, yes, they are worried, in Mexico government. My thesis is because they are, are saying something that is true. A populist leader could have good possibilities in Mexico now but they are not watching the other part. The reason is because they, yes, are le leading a democracy, but an oligarchic one. And, 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 and I think that that's, that's, that's the problem. And La Corte Latin America is, is good, is progressista, is not all the time. Now for us in Mexico, it's an important institution. But maybe it's not the same, and we know that it's not the same for Argentinians and for Uruguay and for Chile, because their decisions are complicated and, and, and every, I don't know, every, every reality is different. But I think that for Mexico, for the moment that we are living now, that institutions are really, really important. And it's true that the, own, the other institution that it's really, really important is our national court. And I'm really worried. Mm -hmm. Many reasons are happening, but I will not. Many things are happening. I will not say too much about that because it's not educado with us. I don't know about that, but I, I just going to say that it's obvious that in this country, you know so well, the judiciary is not independent. Constitutionalism is not possible. I remember I, I wrote a. a, a Comes is a a chronic, a chronic, yes, a world chronic, uh, uh, chronicle yeah. uh, of, a, of a trip that I made to Venezuela in 2009. Uh, Chavez invited me because they had this anniversary of their constitution, and I remember Chavez telling to the people in front of the members of the constitutional court of Venezuela. I will say this in Spanish. I'm sure that you will understand. Ha llegado el momento in Venezuela de dejar atrás la liberal burguesa idea de la separación de los poderes. <laughs> That's populism, that is not democracy, that is not constitutionalism. That's an institutional problem. No? Unfortunately, I will have to take an unpopular decision now. There are still some questions I would ask you to, to ask them now over wine, mostly because um, it is paid for, and if we <laughs> go there, uh, we have yet another uh, problem. I want to thank, first of all, yeah, you all for attending and for the wonderful questions. Luis Duran uh, and the Center for Mexican Studies for co-organizing this event. It is wonderful. Most of all, of course, Pedro, you for, for coming here. Thank Gracias, you. como se dice, bien mexicano. Uh, mm -hmm. Eso es su casa. <laughs> uh, además, se vuelve de verdad con el Centro para Estudios Mexicanos. Thank you very much, uh, and we hope you will come back. Just one say for the Mexicans, and not just for the Mexicans, because you told me that you don't mm, know that. El Centro de Estudios de la UNAM para México está aquí, en una oficina, a cuatro pisos hacia abajo, y vale la pena que lo conozcan y lo aprovechen, porque a Luis le va a dar mucho gusto, y a la UNAM nos da mucho orgullo tenerlo. Muchas gracias.